interesting with that fell list we got. There's like two kids on that list, Jesus and I think one of the Davids, that are really strong readers, which surprises me because the other ones on the list are really weak mm -hmm. readers. You know? hmm. Yeah. So the thing about this is we need to talk about these are the things that we have to do with kids, right? We did all of this while we read. We monitored our comprehension. We kept You kept saying, oh, does this make sense? I'm not sure. We questioned, we asked, oh, is this the three bears? Yes, this is the three bears, these kinds of things. Um, what the heck is this word? How do we figure that out? We made connections, we said to our background knowledge, you may or may not have visualized what the story was like. You inferred, you figured out what was important or not, and you synthesized. I saw people taking notes. You guys had persistence and stamina. You slowed way down. So these are the things that our kids Struggling readers do not know how to do on their own. Um, when I did this the first time, what happened is someone said, oh, I just skipped it. I knew it was about the three bears, so I kind of figured out the words. And so think about that. If you give your kids an article about colonialism, and they look at it and say, oh, okay, yeah, I heard Miss story talk about this yesterday. I don't need to read it. That's what they do. So we have to intentionally teach them how to do all of these things. So these are all the things we just kind of talked about with skilled readers, and I gave you these slides so you have all of this. But we, it's all metacognitive. When we read a text, whether you read it for pleasure or you read it for class, you probably read it two different ways. So I know, Stephanie, you've been in a class recently, right? And if you're reading an article that Mary Burke gives you, you're probably slowing down, annotating the text, thinking, okay, what am I getting out of this? How can I apply it? When you're reading, a book on the beach, it's mindless, right? So you either read it and you're reading it carefully or you come to a part after you've gotten through it, if you've ever done this, and you're like, oh, I know where she's going here. And you kind of skip, you kind of glance through it, but you keep going. So when we read, we set a purpose for ourselves and we really try to figure it out as opposed to when we're reading content area, we really have to teach kids, why am I reading this, what am I doing? So we have to slow down. So the first part of this, we're going to really talk about the data. What do these kids in front of us look like? So this is, one thing about Lexiles, we're just learning more and more about them, the more research is coming out. So I think you probably, if you talked to me before about Lexiles, I'll say typical growth is 100 points. So we're no longer looking at Lexiles like that. And next year, we're developing this really great pattern as literacy coaches to show you guys of if a kid scores a 352, here's how much they'll grow in a year. But in general, if you look at this column on the end, this is what the Common Core is saying the stretch lifestyle band is. So if you're in grade 6 through 8, to be on grade level, you need to fall between 925 and 1185. Okay? And then this kind of flushes it out by grade, the band. One thing you notice is the bands are big. So as kids grow through the year, their lifestyle increases. One thing in middle school is that lifestyles grow very small. We have a small amount of growth. Once kids learn to read, the growth is much smaller than what you would see in elementary school. Just like when they do oral reading fluency in elementary school, kids might start the year at 50 words a minute and they end the year at 150 words a minute. In middle school, they might start the year at 100 and then end the year at 150. So there's just, this growth is really slowed down. But this just shows you kind of a picture of where kids should be reading. Oh, I want to go back to this for a second. One thing I think that's important with left style is this is independence. So if you're giving a kid a silent reading book to read at home, if they're reading at a 900 level and the book is 1,000, that's appropriate. Because those 100 points above, 50 points below. If you're giving that 900 kid a 1,200 book, I, independently, they may struggle a little bit with it. They probably still will persevere because the kid is on grade level. If you're giving a student who's a 300 left style that 900 book, they're really going to struggle independently. But if you're teaching with it in class, it doesn't matter because you're teaching it. They're not reading, kind of like Salem Witch Trials, right? The kids are reading it. I think that's probably in the 800s. You might have some 400s in here, but if you're teaching with it, that's fine because they're not just going ahead and reading through it all on their own. You're breaking down the text for them. So when you think about Lexiles, you have to think about the purpose. How am I using this? You can find Lexiles on um, Lexile.com. Word also does it for you if you type in text. There's a function on Word that does it I can show you. Um, 
but it's really important to know what kind of lexile. It's a mathematical equation for reading, which is kind of weird. It has to do with syntax, phonemes, um, length of sentence structure. So a book that has about ancient Egypt is almost always very, very high. And because it's got words like Mesopotamia, I don't know if that's much of it. But you know what I mean. <laughs> ancient history. But I always use this example that 50 shades of gray is like a high kind of lexile. But the context is clearly not appropriate for a kid who's in a five hundred. <laughs> so it's important to figure out, like, is this appropriate for the students and the lexile? We talk about hearing our kids. It's important to think not only of reading intervention, but also your classroom. Because tier one means everybody in the room is getting it. We're good, everybody's a go. Tier two are those kids we might pull because they're struggling a little bit, but if I re-explain this, or I teach them to annotate, or I teach them how to monitor their comprehension, they're gonna get back into tier one eventually. And then our tier three are those kids that we work really hard at, and they can't make it in tier two, and we have to do some intense direct instruction. Whether it be through reading, math, but those are those tier three kids that aren't making it, and they're all in our classroom. So you guys have full inclusion, and you have tier one to tier three, and probably every class you do. Even the PC, I think, is having some time. Um, okay, so look on your slides that you have here. This is how we tiered the kids this year. So if you look, you see, um, if you just pick an example for grade five, in order to be in a tier one group, you, your lexile was 600 or above, and you scored a 3, 4, or 5 on a pop. And then tier 2 was 451 to 600, level 2 or 3, and then tier 3 is 0 to 450. That doesn't line up with this. And they may guess why we changed these numbers. These are much more rigorous. But why do you think we, we bumped down these numbers? Why might we do that here? Because if a student is reading a 600 level lexile in grade five, that's actually below grade level. But we're saying here, hey, you're a tier one, you're in book club. There might there be a reason. So the reason and reality here at the classroom is the number. So I would guess Lucia probably had close to 30 in her room, right? And I would guess. I probably could have made two classrooms, but I don't have enough bodies to do that. So she's got 30 kids that are almost all tier one, and then that happens down the way. So we probably have 40 students maybe that are in tier three, and I don't have the bodies to teach them. So we played with the numbers this year to try to suit the need as best. If I was in my classroom, I don't know that I would, I would not use this formula. Okay, so I think it's really important. If a student's score, scoring a four or five on the part and their lexile is high, I would say those students are tier one. Um, it's those students that are the threes, high threes on the part still might be tier one, but you've got to really look at their scores and figure out what's going on in class when you're flushing out your kids. So I wanted you to know the system that we used this year for reading intervention and why we used it, but it's not necessarily the system in a perfect world. A tier three group would never be bigger than eight, and we know that our tier three are 15. And I probably could have made them bigger, but we had to use the resources we had. So we're playing with that configuration and trying to make it to make it better. So when you look at lexiles, and I told you a little bit about how we group kids, I want you to look at some data. There's um, two columns I want you to cross out on this sheet because what Park did was they tried to make a mathematical equation to fit it into MCAS. So you see the two columns that say 2016 SS, and right next to it, PRF, cross those two out. Perfect. So now, I'm telling you that this is a someone's reading workshop group. These kids are all grouped together. What I want you to do in a group is just spend some time looking at the data and talk about things that you notice. So just to quickly go across the logistics, February SRI is the most current SRI they just took, all the way back to the first SRI, their Lexile in September. And if you skip over, you see the PARC score, and then the performance level of PARC. Okay, obviously um, five is the highest PARC score you can get, one is the lowest. 
And then those last two columns, actually, I cut and pasted weird. So, but these kids are all together in intervention. So, see what you notice through the data. Um, 